Well, hello again and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood and I'm currently the president of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Astronomy Toronto is seen monthly here on the Rogers Cable 10 network and during the last couple shows we've been talking about a very important event in the history of Canadian space exploration. That is the first Canadian astronaut to go up into space. The uh, 41G space shuttle mission was launched October 5th, 1984, and as we all know now, Mark Garneau was aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger for that eight-day mission. Today, from the Holiday Inn in downtown Toronto, we're going to be listening to Mark Garneau explain to us exactly how exciting the trip was. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be here, to be able to speak to you about the fantastic adventure that I had uh, about three or four weeks ago up in space. I had the time of my life, as you can imagine, and it's something that a lot of Canadians want to know about. And I want to try to explain it to the best of my abilities to give other people some sort of inkling of what it's like to be up there. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I've had the chance to go to heaven and to come back. And the memories that I will carry of that particular experience will be with me always. And I think language fails us when we try to describe what it is like, and I would say even the most seasoned writer uh, might find it a difficult job to come back and, and eloquently explain to people what it really felt like while he was up there. So the only solution is for as many of us as possible to get up there and to feel it for ourselves. But until that time comes, I thought that the little film, that uh, the little bit of video that uh, I brought along would probably give you a good flavor of what life is like up there in the orbiter. I was up there for eight days, eight absolutely incredible days, with, seven other pe with six other people. It was the Challenger. We went around the Earth 133 times. We went over Canada very many times during that, uh, during uh, that eight day voyage. I had a chance to look down at my own country. And although you do tend to lose a little bit the feeling of belonging to a particular part of the world, it was always lovely for me to be able to recognize that part of the globe because I am a Canadian. The film is, is really more of a homemade movie. It's not glossy. It's not the sort of standards that I know that you work towards. Uh, it was taken by various members of the crew, and it was to try to, as I say, give people a feeling for what life is like on board. I was up there to do a bunch of experiments. In some cases, you'll see us each going about our work doing our experiments, but we're also having a lot of fun. Just to uh, explain the first little part of it, there's about 20 seconds at the beginning where you see what looks like the launch. And in fact, it's a camera that's in the pilot's window. And you imagine the orbiter in the vertical position. And it's taking a picture of what it sees. And the orbiter takes off and starts to roll. And you'll see the orbiter basically, or what the orbiter sees, rising and rolling and passing through the cloud cover. So that's something you have to look for right at the beginning in order to understand it. If you put your head on your right, sh right shoulder, you'll, you'll probably be able to straighten out your perspective a little bit. And anyway, I'll ramble on after that point uh, as, the, as the video continues to try to uh, give you a feeling for some of the things that maybe aren't straightforward. Okay, that's the, uh, the launch. There you are coming through the uh, cloud cover. And all this is taking place uh, with those two great big solid rocket boosters uh, firing. And they go on for about two minutes. At that point, they separate. And you're using the three main engines to take you on for six and a half more minutes until you're up into space 190 nautical miles above the Earth. Here, we're actually ascending on that first orbit. And we passed right over Halifax. So you can imagine the trajectory from Florida, passing over Halifax, gaining altitude all the way along. And that, in fact, is uh, looking down at the Atlantic seaboard on our way up. Inside the orbiter, I was just, uh, I think my heartbeat was probably very, very high. I know it was, as a matter of fact. I was just basically 
a victim of the experience, if you like. Uh, you don't control that sort of power as it's, uh, as it's uh, uh, building up and taking you up there. You just sit back and you try to enjoy it. And I think I enjoyed it. <laughs> I beg your pardon? My heartbeat actually uh, is classified information, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll only tell you that it was 70 higher than, uh, than when I started. So you're on your way up there, and at this point the acceleration is building up, and it builds up to about three Gs by the time they finally cut the engines and you float out of your seat. First thing you do is open up the cargo bay to have a look at the, uh, at, the outside, at the inside to see that everything's okay. And then, just to reassure the people on the ground, you show them some video of all the crew members. There's our fantastic commander, Bob Crippen. Uh, this was his fourth mission. He loved peanuts. I think he was eating peanuts in that uh, particular sequence. Very cool character indeed. John McBride, our pilot. Uh, John's setting up uh, our little portable computer there called Dr. Spock. And uh, we use those uh, portable computers for all sorts of different tasks. One to tell us, there you see me doing a little bit of backseat driving. That's to prove to the world that I really was up there. <laughs> that little computer is used for all sorts of things, like telling you exactly where you are at all times over the earth, which is very useful because sometimes you don't recognize where you are. There is uh, Kathy Sullivan. Uh, who, in fact, got her PhD at Dalhousie University, so has a, quite a strong Canadian connection. And there's Dave Liesma. He, was, uh, he and Kathy were the two that did the spacewalk on the fifth or sixth day. And he's holding something that uh, activates getaway uh, specials in the cargo bay. There is uh, Paul Scully Power singing Pavarotti. <laughs> Actually, he's trying to figure out where we are uh, so that he can go and look out the window and study ocean dynamics. And there, of course, Sally Ride, who's probably the best known uh, astronaut uh, in the American Corps on her second mission. And what she's doing there is basically maneuvering the Canadarm around, checking it out, and using the television monitors, monitors which you may be able to see, two stacked on each other in the, in the corner there. She looks out the window, uh, the, looking aft, and there's also one overhead to, uh, to extend her vision to see uh, that the, uh, everything is going all right. The Canadarm, of course, was used extensively throughout the mission for some things that were planned and also for some things that were unexpected, and it performed beautifully. I was very proud up there to see it work so well. There you see the Canadarm sort of dipping down, looking back through the cargo bay. Those, spot, those spots that uh, appear to be there are, in fact, frost spots uh, due to condensation in one of the uh, in one of the windows uh, between the panes. Uh, Sally uh, had to do a number of things, but the most critical evolution on the first day was to release the Herb satellite, which is at the end of the arm there. And there are two big panels, one on each side, which uh, get opened up later on, you'll see. And they have the solar arrays on them, and they're used to provide power to it. And they had problems opening those solar arrays and they turned it towards the sun to, to try to warm it up a bit because there are sometimes problems with things getting too cold up there. We're talking a very harsh environment, temperatures uh, that swing from minus 250 to plus 250 uh, in an almost perfect vacuum. It's a very harsh environment and uh, sometimes you perhaps under-design things a little bit. There you see the solar panels that are opened up. In fact, you can't see them there, but there were targets very well there, but there are targets on the underside of those, of those solar rays that were put on a Canadian request in order for us to be able to do one of our experiments, which was the National Research Council's space vision system, which will be tested the next time a Canadian goes up in 1986. We wanted to gather some video uh, of this satellite with the targets on it. There's uh, Sally uh, getting ready to do the deployment, and you'll see the arm pull back uh, away from the actual herb satellite and then the pilot did a retrograde burn which moved the orbiter down and away to actually cause separation between the satellite and the orbiter to prevent recontact at a later time and basically from that point on the two moved further and further apart and solar ma uh, bigger pardon, the herb satellite went off and did its thing and as I understand it's working uh, just beautifully so that was the first day evolution, a very critical one. You're, I'm at the uh, aft window, and I'm setting up a rather 
complicated looking camera system to uh, look at uh, the glow that comes off the orbiter. This is something that interests scientists very much, why the orbiter should glow. And this is a sort of an optical setup involving a camera and an image intensifier, which is basically a photomultiplier that amplifies the light and a, and a grating and slit arrangement. And I'm setting it up at the, uh, at the aft window. And I took about 800 photographs doing that sort of thing. There's Paul Scully Power again. He's still trying to figure out where we are. <laughs> and uh, he's going to go over and look out the window, just perhaps that'll give him a clue. And that's basically how you'd park yourself to look out the window. Remember, the orbiter is upside down. The cargo bay is facing the Earth, and he's actually looking down at the Earth. He's not looking up at the stars. There, you're, there we are going over the uh, Nile. It was always absolutely s stupendous, the view in that part of the world. There was never a cloud. Uh, there's the Red Sea. It's quite understandable that they've had droughts uh, in areas like Ethiopia. There never seemed to be any cloud cover in that part of the world. The colors look washed out compared to what you see. There's no way that any film medium at the moment can adequately uh, reproduce what, what you see with your eyes. You have to, you really do have to see it for yourself. And that's the sort of rate that we're moving, five miles per second for people who want to relate it to, uh, to the ground. There I am uh, looking out the side hatch window holding a sun photometer, which we use to point at the sun and to measure solar radiation. And uh, I had to wear special glasses for this one. We had a special filter over the side hatch window. And uh, uh, this was the first time any instrument like this had been brought up. And we were talking about the results yesterday and very exciting indeed. That was sponsored by uh, the Environment uh, Service, the Atmospheric Environment Service. And that's uh, a little more of the Nile as we're going further down over uh, Africa. And uh, there you can tell me uh, which one of us is upside down. I'm at the window, and uh, Kathy is taking notes for me for one of my experiments. Actually, I'm right behind me is the bathroom, which uh, I wasn't very popular when I went to that side hatch window to do my experiments, uh, especially with seven people on board. But I did it as fast as I could. They're looking out into the cargo bay. Uh, the Serbi antenna, which is a, a, a synthetic aperture radar, and you may have seen the fantastic picture that it took of uh, the Montreal area. That's one of the leaves of that radar, that big thing sort of up in the vertical position. It's a very big radar that, that is pointed down towards the Earth and that takes all these uh, beautiful images. There's uh, Bob Crippen again relaxing uh, in one of his few breaks. Uh, he was a very, very busy man. I think we set a record for numbers of orbital maneuvers uh, during our flight. And uh, Sally getting ready for another experiment, the orbiter refueling system, which was to show that you can uh, demonstrate that you can refuel satellites up in space uh, uh, by transferring hydrazine fuel to them uh, from the orbiter. And that worked very well uh, during uh, during our flight. There's the, uh, the, the radar that I mentioned to you on the uh, left-hand side. It's fully extended there, and it goes almost the whole length of the uh, actual cargo bay. And it's pointed down towards the Earth, and uh, it's a type of radar, and it, it uh, has very high definition in the order of 20 to 30 yards definition, and gives spectacular pictures. Uh, when they're when they're processed because we're trying to investigate motion sickness and why people get sick up there and Paul would act as a subject for me and then I would act as a subject for him so we gathered data on two people and uh, that went very well and he's actually looking at a, a, a target that's on the uh, locker and you there's uh, Sally. Uh, one of the other things that Sally had to do was to move the arm around to do unexpected jobs. And in this particular case, she used it to close the leaf on, on, on that radar. And she did this by applying pressure. You see the Canadarm end effector pushing down there. And that was one of the unexpected jobs it did. And uh, they spoke so highly of it, in fact, that uh, they were talking about it doing all sorts of things uh, that, uh, that haven't been thought of in the past. You may be familiar with IMAX uh, film uh, from uh, the CineSphere here in Toronto. Well, we took the IMAX camera up with us. This is this incredible 70 millimeter film that uh, they project on, on screens that are 100 uh, feet by 80 feet, and uh, you have to see it to believe it. Well, we took, uh, I think, probably 
um, 10,000 feet of it uh, while we were up there. And that was uh, changing the film at that time, which was quite a complicated procedure because the camera on Earth itself weighs about 90 pounds, and you're working with 1,000-foot rolls of 70-millimeter film. There are uh, a bunch of us up in the flight deck. Uh, when all seven of us were up there, it was a very crowded place. You see the two aft windows very well there. And there, I think we're going over part of Greece and the Mediterranean. Some of you may recognize that. As I say, the blues are much bluer in, in reality, and the land itself uh, doesn't look, uh, it looks a bit washed out there, but it really is uh, incredible when you're up there. On the day that they do the spacewalk, uh, they move around a lot of things in the mid-deck uh, because it takes several hours to get dressed, and there's one of the suits that uh, they put on, and they've taken that out of the airlock in preparation for putting it on. As I say, it takes several hours to do it. When you're going to go out into vacuum, uh, you want to make sure that you uh, dress yourself properly, and uh, you're going to take all the time it takes to, uh, to put them on properly. They're $2 million suits. They're very well designed, but uh, you still don't want to take any chances. John McBride was basically responsible for helping uh, both uh, Kathy and, uh, and Dave to uh, get dressed uh, for the uh, spacewalk. And of course, Kathy was the first woman uh, American woman to walk in space and uh, you need help to get dressed you can't do it by yourself uh, there's the island of Crete uh, nice view passing over the entire island of Crete one of the things we do as I say up there is take a great many photographs which are of interest to geologists and uh, people in various fields oceanography people concerned with agriculture uh, because these photographs reveal so much there's three of us down in the mid-deck. Paul Scully Power in the background, still trying to figure out where we are. And uh, John in the, in the front, uh, doing some, with his hands in the bag again, changing some more IMAX film. And myself uh, on the right-hand side, uh, setting up another one of my experiments. Uh, you may think it's sort of cramped, but you have to remember in zero G, you can use the whole volume. Uh, you don't sort of walk around on the floor. You can use the ceiling. Uh, as much as, uh, as the floor, up or down, really doesn't make any, any uh, difference. You're quite comfortable anyway, in any attitude, and you use that whole volume. So really, it's like having more space than you think. Uh, Sally there is checking dosimeters that, that monitor the amount of radiation um, getting into the orbiter. It's a very harsh environment up in space, as I mentioned, and one of the things is, is, uh, is the amount of radiation, although I can assure you it's at safe levels. There is uh, Kathy coming down uh, into the, into the uh, mid-deck area. There were two ways of getting down on the way she's just come down and also one on the other side. And uh, they're, uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing at that point. I think to some extent that was to show uh, a unique shot of two women in space uh, at the same time, which of course was, was uh, the first time that this had occurred. There you see the ease with which people float around in, in this weightlessness. There's John McBride uh, preparing lunch that day. I think he's, uh, I think we had peanuts and pears that day. And uh, he's got the, uh, he's got the trays uh, which have magnets stuck on the sides of the galley, which is the area where we prepare the food. And in actual fact, you can prepare food for seven people in about 20 minutes. Uh, it's very well packaged food. You uh, basically add water and heat. That's, that's how simple it is. And the food, although it's not great, is certainly very easy to eat, and it, there's quite a bit of variety. And there are Sally and Kathy, uh, I think they happen to be pulling out a meal at that point for, uh, everybody does their share, by the way. Uh, I, I, we were seven people, uh, I did my share of the cooking. Uh, there, I think we're eating fresh food. Uh, carrots is what I'm eating there. Although my mother told me not to play with food, uh, you can't help but uh, do it up there. It's one of the fun things of being in space. There's, uh, there's the captain, Crippen, uh, up eating on the ceiling, and Sally, <laughs> Kathy right beside him, also on the ceiling, eating her meal. I mean, any old place will do. <laughs> and I think Paul Scully Power, who's in the corner there, uh, I think he'd given up on trying to figure out where he was, asked me to pass him the bread, and so I just passed him the loaf. And so you see, we did have fresh food up there. 
And there's uh, Dave Liesma, who is doing some exercise. I'm not sure he's enjoying himself, but uh, uh, actually it was one of the nice ways of relieving yourself to, to, to get on this exerciser, which held you down and tried to simulate the normal 1G of, of Earth. Because you need a bit of exercise because your muscles aren't being, uh, aren't being uh, exercised at all. I'm just taking notes there at the end of the day uh, so that I can report down to the ground what experiments I've been able to accomplish. I think somebody said at that point, uh, this is like in the, in, the, in the movie business, don't just sit there, do something, move around. And so I said, okay, I'll head up for the flight deck and uh, took off. This is to show you how many people were really actually on the flight. If you count them, I think you'll find that there were really 14 of us. We're doing a fly past here through the mid deck. <laughs> and you can't see it on the monitors, but it says fly Navy on the galley. And it was a, a Navy mission, which we were rather proud of. And you'll see there are actually 14 people. Here I am snagged in a cable. And it looks like we're going slow motion, but that's really how you move. That's real speed. There we go, second, second squadron passing by. And of course, there was a 15th person, the cameraman. You never saw, you never saw her during the whole trip. We had a ball, there's no doubt about it. If you ever have a chance to get up there, I encourage you to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions that uh, anybody's been wondering about? What, what's the size of the entire ship? Uh, the outer dimensions? Oh, inner, inner. The, inner, the inner dimensions. I think probably the mid-deck itself is about, uh, I think it's about as uh, wide as this, this table here, the, the, the table right here, and it's about uh, maybe six feet deep, and the ceiling is about here. Now that's the mid deck. The flight deck up above it is like a large cockpit in a commercial airliner. So those two areas together uh, constitute the living area. Mark, how difficult was it for the crew in such confined quarters to avoid pushing a wrong button or pulling a plug when they snag their feet on a wire or something? All the critical switches have guards over them, so uh, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to flick them. Uh, they have special things that cover them. Uh, sometimes uh, a wire would get pulled away, uh, but never, never was anything broken because a lot of things are just sort of velcroed to, to different places. So all you do is rip away the, the velcro uh, hooks from the pile, and uh, you just stick it back on. So no problems. You must have discussed it while you're up there. How do you see space travel in the future? Well. Uh, how do I see? That's a very broad question to try to answer. I think that uh, in Canada, um, I think that from, from a global point of view, we're going out there. It's going to happen. People uh, can argue about how fast it's going to happen. The uh, NASA has already announced that it intends to, after the space station, begin to establish a moon base. And subsequently, we're talking about going to Mars. And when you talk about Mars, going to Mars, you're talking about a nine month trip to get there. You stay there six months to a year, and it takes you nine months to get back, typically. It depends on the kind of propulsion you use. So we're talking about probably in sometime in the first 20 years of the next century, people going on a two-year trip to Mars. I think that's about as far as, as we're looking, as NASA is looking in an active way. I hope, I hope that Canadians are involved uh, in the development of space and these subsequent voyages. What is in the future for you? I know one of the public speaking tour across the country is over. What do you go on to then? I, I uh, was hired as a payload specialist, uh, which is to go up and do science up in space. And uh, I've done my job, and now there are two more Canadians in our group of six who will be going up, probably both in 1986. We have to do a lot of work to get ready, and I have to support them in getting ready. So. When the public speaking engagements are going to die down, 
I will go back into an engineering support role to help them get ready for their missions in 1986. Well, uh, they, my, my five fellow astronauts have told me that they'd break my kneecaps if I got up before, the, before any of them made it up, so I think I'm probably the sixth in line now for, uh, for a mission, and I hope I will definitely have a chance. Particularly, it would be exciting to go up around space station time. Okay, uh, one of the things that hardly anybody ever talks about uh, that occurs in weightlessness is that you stretch. You actually grow by an inch or two while you're up there. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about your spinal column, of course. And, and uh, there are... I'm not a doctor, but the materials between your disc uh, tend to stretch out. And this does, energy, uh, does activate some nerves and gives people backache. And it's quite a pronounced dull backache, which you feel down here. And almost everybody is affected to some degree by it because of weightlessness. And the other thing is your muscles around your stomach feel sore. And we're not exactly sure why this should happen, because there's really no strain. And I think it's probably your body trying to trying to get rid of your backache and, and tightening up your muscles. So those are a couple of unexpected things that, you, that, that occur in weightlessness. And as soon as you get back down to the ground, it's as if you'd never been up there. Thank you. Where does Canada go from here? Well, we have five other astronauts who are looking forward to a chance to fly aboard the space shuttle. Two of them will be flying in the year 1986. In early 1985, these astronauts will be named to two separate space shuttle missions. And then into the 1990s, Canada expects to, have to take part in the building of the American Space Station. Well, next month on Astronomy Toronto, we hope to report to you on an expedition to Papua New Guinea for a total eclipse of the sun. November 23rd, there's another total eclipse of the sun only visible in the South Pacific. Myself and several members of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada will be going on the other side of the world to witness about a minute's worth of total eclipse. So if we're not clouded out, if we have a successful expedition, we'll have some slides and be talking to you about eclipses in general and what we were able to observe. So until then, this is Randy Atwood for Astronomy Toronto, reporting from downtown Toronto. We'll see you next time. <laughs>